This podcast may contain content that is graphic and disturbing in nature. Listener discretion is advised. A brutal attack on a young child and her grandmother would result in the conviction of the child's uncle for murder. But his wife was adamant that her husband did not commit this crime, and she set out to prove to everyone that the real perpetrator had escaped justice and an innocent man was in prison. This is the Melinda Dawson story. Hey, Amy. Hello, Megan. Great to see you, and I'm thrilled to kick off summer vacation from school. You're teaching two classes though, right? Yeah, but you know, it's online where we've got, we got to make our summer camping plans. Got to go down in the book right away. Congrats on the new house. Thank you. <laughs> you know, so we'll do the camping, the usual fun stuff and just enjoy the summer and our new houses. All right. And for today's episode, I also want to thank my very good friend, Michelle Bedore for bringing us this great case, which I had never heard of before, but she suggested it. And now I'm thrilled to cover it. And I think you're going to see, I would dare say that Melinda is one of our female trailblazers. And perhaps you're going to see when I explain the episode. Good. We yeah. haven't done one of these in a while. No, we haven't. Um, and it didn't start out that way. That wasn't what I thought when I initially began. But at the end, I was like, oh, she is. So on this episode, I'm going to do things a little differently, Amy. Instead of beginning with Melinda's childhood, I'm going to begin with the event that drives Melinda's story. And I hope later on you and the audience will understand why I made this choice. Right. And also, before we get there, we would like to thank some of our supporters. Thank you so much to Adriana from Davie, Florida, Ty Lynn from Boise, Idaho, Jennifer, and Danielle, who listens with her hubby, Adam, who bought her a Patreon subscription as a gift. I love this. Isn't I that love sweet? that people are doing this gifting with their family mm-hmm. members. So cool. Very cool. And we last, we have Allie from South Carolina, who likes our accents. Again, I'm not sure what accent for me. Uh, I think they're talking about you. Well, either way, I'm sure I would love her accent because I love yeah. accents. Southern, from, yeah. yeah, so Southern cute. Southern accent, yeah. All right. Thank you so much for your support. We appreciate it. And we look forward to seeing you all soon. Other than becoming a patron... There are many ways you can support us. Follow us wherever you listen to your podcast so that you can get notified when we release new shows. Leave us a review, follow us on social media, and share our episodes with a friend. For now, let's begin with the evening of June 7th, 1998. Melissa Dawson stayed home with her two sons, one of whom was sick, while her husband Clarence went out drinking with some friends. And he got home rather late, around 2.30 a.m. That's a, Oh, boy. Yeah, I wake a, up kind of close to that time. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> Two hours later, Amy's awake working out. And the pair were awakened pretty soon after in the early morning to over a dozen police officers at their front door. They were asking Melinda and Clarence about Melinda's mother, 68-year-old Judy Johnson, and Melinda's six-year-old niece, Brooke, who had also been sleeping over at Judy's home that evening. What was revealed about Judy and Brooke was absolutely horrifying. Six-year-old Brooke at the time woke up after passing out from a brutal sexual attack and beating to find her grandmother bludgeoned to death, sexually assaulted and strangled. Mm. So this is a horror scene. It appeared as well that like Judy may have tried to hide Brooke, but the assailant found her nonetheless and likely left Brooke for dead after he attacked the girl. But he would be wrong because Brooke did not die. She regained consciousness early in the morning, but this badly beaten little six-year-old girl went to a neighbor's house next door, Tanya Brazel, and this was the woman who answered the door. But this woman left Brooke to sit on the porch for 45 minutes before helping her. Why? Well, I think it's odd, and I'd like you to keep that in mind, so there might be some reasons. Just file this away mentally. I'm assuming she called 911? No, she did not call 911. The neighbor was, apparently she was getting her own children ready for school, but it, and it was suggested that maybe she was afraid to have them see this girl like bl- bloody and beaten. But instead of calling 911, she took Brooke home. And Brooke's father like sprang into action going over to Judy's house to find that Judy had not made it and called the police. So he's the one who called 911. I think that's odd as well. Yeah. Yeah. 911 would have been the right call. Though in a very bad physical state, Brooke said that she could identify her assailant because she said it was her uncle Clarence, Melinda's husband. 
Oh, wow. Yeah. This was like shock upon shock, right? And this happened very quickly. Melinda and Clarence were adamant that he had not committed the crime. Nonetheless, he was arrested and charged with this vicious attack on his mother-in-law and his niece. And I mean, this is just the day after the crime had occurred. So as you can imagine, Amy, this was a real blow to a family that was already in shock. I'm con- I have so many questions, yeah. which I'm assuming you'll answer, but you'll talk about their relationship, Clarence and the niece. And OK, um, I'm not I'm not going to cover too much about their relationship, but I will discuss the relationship between him and his mother in law. Oh, because it was his mother in law. It was his gotcha. mother in law. Okay. So this is Melinda's and like mother. His niece in law, like his niece, but his niece on like his wife's side. Correct. So okay. not through blood. Gotcha. So Melinda's sister, April, and the rest of the family stopped speaking to Melinda. I mean, they thought her husband was the murderer. April was the mom of the niece. Yes. Okay. Um, so sorry. A- April was Brooke's mother. Everyone in Melinda's family turned on her and, and Clarence, believing that she was defending a murderer and a rapist. And Melinda stuck by him. She, she was insistent that he had not been guilty. Melinda was actually forced into, she went through a really tough time as well. She was forced basically to declare bankruptcy due to the loss of her husband's income and mounting legal bills preparing for a trial because it's very costly to go to trial for murder. I don't know what the average murder case costs, but a high profile one. I mean, we're talking about probably at least a half a million dollars if you have it. So it was very costly to go to trial. But one year later, and pretty much almost exactly one year later, that's what happened. They went to trial and the trial was held in an Ohio courtroom in 1999. And Brooke was the star witness. There wasn't much other evidence, though, Amy, just some testimony that Judy and Clarence didn't get along that well, and then the eyewitness testimony of Brooke. But they didn't have any DNA at trial. There was no surveillance, no cell phone, no computer searches, no previous history. So Alibi? Let's talk about that right now. For, also, for a point of clarification in, in discussing the alibi, we should understand that Melinda's mother lived an hour away. She wasn't around the corner or on the way home from the bar or anything like that. And so the early morning of her attack, Clarence was home around 2.30, which could be established by his friends, neighbors who testified, and and Melinda, who claimed that she saw Clarence when the attacks on Judy and Brooke happened. So the attacks on Judy and Brooke were estimated to happen between 2.30 and 5 a.m., which would mean that Clarence would have had to leave his home and drive an hour away in a seriously inebriated state, which he and Melinda were both adamant did not happen. Sorry if I'm getting too specific, but... How do they know what happened after 2 a.m.? By time of death with the grandmother's body? You said between like 2 and 5. Yeah, obviously. they know by time of death. They know okay. by, you know, there's obviously like rigor mortis. Yeah. And, oh, okay. I, I didn't know if there were eyewitnesses or that like, or someone spoke to the grandmother at 2 or something. You know, I didn't know if there was other evidence. There very well might have been. Okay. Um, I'm not sure okay. what it is, but I know it was very well established that it was 2.30 to 5. Okay. There wasn't really much dispute about gotcha. this timeline. So if he gets home at 2.30... I mean, he's got to leave his house and drive an hour away to commit these crimes, which could happen. I mean, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it seems unlikely. And so, you know, this was they thought that the kind of the crux of their defense was the timeline doesn't make sense. There's no possible way he could have done that. And so none of them remember getting up and hearing the father leave. The sons did not. I don't believe the sons remembered that. I believe it was Mm -hmm. just Melinda, which, again, then you could look at it. That's, you know, that's his wife, of Mm -hmm. course. But his friends established the time he got home. And I'm almost positive that a neighbor was able to establish it as well. But it sounds like the issue is not what time he got home. The issue is whether he left the home once he got there. Yeah, that's Mm -hmm. true. But there was really not much further evidence. And so Melinda and Clarence were, I, I don't know if they were confident, but I think they felt like, hey, they don't really have a case against me. Regardless, Amy, after 13 hours of deliberations, the jury came back with a guilty verdict of aggravated assault, sexual assault, and murder. Clarence was sentenced to life in prison, but Melinda told him it was not over. She was going to find her mother's real murderer, but with no formal training and the lack of financial resources, where would she begin? You know what this reminds me of? What? Remember the case I covered? Uh, Shiloh. Oh, what, right? I thought about yeah. it. Yeah. Shiloh Waisaki. Yeah. Shiloh Waisaki and, and Angela, Angela Samoto. Samoto. Yes, yes. I definitely thought of that. It's a little different, but similar in the sense that like... I need to figure this out. You know? Yeah. That's cool. Well, she actually began where I bet a lot of listeners might begin. The internet. Close. Very close. <laughs> it was also, what was the year back then? It was 1999. The yellow pages? I don't know. <laughs> well, she started with crime shows. Oh, okay. She started specifically with forensic files. You mean just to kind of get ideas and try to figure it out? About forensics and DNA, uh-huh. learning like Interesting. things you can do to investigate, evidence uh-huh. you can still collect. 
She also contacted a private investigator, Martin Yant. Have you ever heard of him? No, but it sounds like the name of that a private investigator would have. It does, actually. Right? <laughs> um, the reason she contacted him is because he's been instrumental in several exonerations with um, wrongful conviction cases. I looked up his bio. It turns out, according to his website, that he's helped, I think him and his like, firm, have helped exonerate 23 wrongfully convicted individuals. Wow. So I think he's right yeah. up there with like Kathleen Zellner in this That's regard. That's pretty cool, yeah. Martin knew the odds were not in their favor, but agreed to ask, and he became a mentor to Melissa, teaching her tricks of the trade, so to speak. And that's what he could do, you know, without resources. And on the side note, I think it's ironic that my friend Michelle, who you obviously know very well, recommended this episode, because if she wasn't such a great real estate agent, she would be a top-notch private investigator. She's got skills. Like whenever I need a contact for direct appeal or for anything else, that I can't, if I can't find it, I'll go to her. Five minutes. She'll huh. have everything I need, like a research, like a bio, you know. She should definitely be a private investigator. Okay, so Melinda began her own investigation, making a list of the potential suspects who could have committed the crimes, which included people that Judy might have known, acquaintances, neighbors, someone who didn't like her. So that's a good place to start. She also began following the people on this list. Well, that's not safe. Well, no, what's not safe, she sometimes made like direct contact with them, but obviously not as herself as, you know, an investigator. But she would say like she would follow someone to a bar and like, you know, talk to them like she was going to the bar, mm -hmm. pretending like she was, you know, someone mm -hmm. that she wasn't a patron. But this was really all in an effort to collect their DNA covertly, which she did. Is that legal? You know, I think that that's a concern later on. Okay. Yeah, you know, uh, police are allowed to collect like DNA yeah. from discarded. Can a private person collect your DNA? Yeah, but will it be admissible in court later on is really the question. Yeah, and that's is a question. it handled correctly? Gotcha. And that's a question of whether or not the evidence was tainted, all of these issues. So Judy, she was not married. Was she dating? She have like any... She didn't have anything shady going on? No, I believe Melinda's father, uh, they were divorced. Actually, I think he was deceased at mm -hmm. the time, but... No, she didn't have any, like, there was no, you know, companions or partners, anyone in the... That people knew of. Well, that people knew of. Okay. So, Melinda collects this, you know, DNA, and maybe the DNA is free, but testing DNA is very costly, Amy, mm -hmm. and Melinda doesn't have any money. In addition, she'd been estranged from her family for almost four years at this point, and she didn't know if Brooke even still believed Clarence was now guilty, now that she's older. So what does she do? Well, she made a pretty brave decision to reach out to her sister, April, who was Brooke's mother. And she was scared. I mean, it had been four years. Everybody turned on her. Can you even imagine that? Can you, yeah, I'm no, just, that can must you, have been so hard. And so you want to support your husband because you know he's not a murderer, right? So she was very scared. But Melinda said that both April and Brooke welcomed her with open arms and seemed what? very happy to see her. Meaning that they believed that Clarence was, in fact, innocent? Well, I'll get to that part. She was afraid to even make contact. She didn't know if they were going to be like, get out, you know, yeah. close the door. Like, we don't even want to hear from you. But they were like really happy to see her. And then in a stunning revelation from Brooke, she admitted that she could no longer be sure that Clarence was her assailant. How old was Brooke now? She was close to 10. She believed her assailant had brown, not blue eyes, and she was just confused because she was young. She had just sustained a traumatic event and they looked somewhat alike. So we don't know yet, right? So it could have been him or someone that looked like him. Exactly. But there was more because Brooke was willing to and would later give a tape deposition attesting to the fact that she believed she was wrong about Uncle Clarence being her assailant. I don't think people are going to believe her. Oh, you're right. so smart, Amy. Melinda and Clarence were feeling hopeful, though, that like this testimony from Brooke would mm -hmm. compel a judge to grant a new trial yeah. or something. But they were definitely wrong, as you pointed out. A judge denied the request. Yeah, because she could have been coached yeah. for those four years. Also, the judge said maybe she was just so happy to reunite with her aunt and felt pressure to like yeah. have the family back together. Like There were any number of reasons someone could change their mind. Yeah. So Melinda would have to do more work, and that she did. She went on to get Mark Godsey head of the Ohio Innocence Project, on board. And we know who that is, right? We do know who that is. We know his wife, Michelle, yeah. as well, who has been working on some cases where we've had you know, a mutual interest. Yes. So we've actually spoken with her. It's funny how in our summer cases, have you noticed, like even yeah. with direct appeal, these things start crossing over? Yeah. So he is the head of the Ohio Innocence so Project. So I'm wondering now, there must be some DNA available in the case to test. She participated in news stories, Melinda, and raised money for DNA testing. Mm -hmm. And testing of items from the crime scene would show that unidentified male DNA was present. And it did not match Clarence. But that could just mean there was another male there. And this information did not persuade a judge, which was shocking. Like, to I'm not which surprised. was shocking to Melinda. Yeah. She was shocked. But she realized at this point the only option she had to free her husband 
was going to be to find the real killer. Yeah. I mean, all that tells you is that um, there was another male there. That doesn't mean Clarence wasn't there. No, it doesn't mean that. But they didn't. They never had Clarence's DNA. Yeah. And it was his mother-in-law's house. Yeah, but how many people get convicted by just, you know, yeah, uh, we know that. an eyewitness? So. Yeah, that's yeah. very true. Mm. So Melinda realizes that she is going to have to find the real killer. So what does she do? She begins from the beginning all over again. And with a fresh look, a surprising new lead would emerge. How does she begin again? She pulls out basically articles, newspaper articles. So she begins reading about the case. And one, she said, stood out in particular to her. And this was an article about the neighbor whose house Brooke had gone to for help. Remember the neighbor, Tanya Brazel? Yes, very much. Okay, you're in it. If you remember, and as a reminder, Tanya had driven Brooke home, but only after 45 minutes of having a bloody and battered six-year-old girl on her porch. And Melinda and others always thought this was one of the oddest things. So, you know, they, they same question that you had. Why didn't she just call 911? That's what people do. Well, as Melinda read on, she was shocked to learn that Tanya's common law husband, Earl Mann, who had been living next door to Judy with Tanya, yeah. had been a convicted sex offender who was released from prison shortly before the attack. And he had been charged and convicted in three other sexual assaults of children under 10 years old. So, so she goes to get his DNA. So Earl Mann goes straight to the top of Melinda's mm -hmm. suspect list. But now, you know, they need his DNA. But that wasn't going to be so easy because he was in prison for these sexual assault convictions. So they probably have his DNA on file. Yeah, but how is she going to get it? What would you do? Well, no, she's going to have Mark Godsey get it. Yeah, but <laughs> I, that's actually not what happened. Really? She was getting it. She was doing the, the work herself. You know, he was involved in the legal end, but uh, mm -hmm. like the appeals end, I think, yeah. you know, I don't think he, he wasn't, was yeah, he wasn't collecting like DNA. Yeah. What would you do? I mean, I'm just curious. If you needed to get someone's DNA in prison. Oh, I would write them a letter. Ah! And then they would lick the envelope and send it back to write back. So, so does she write back pretending she wants to like date him or something? She wrote to him and that's, that was this so good. This also reminds me of what is that other case that it was, remember, they were in prison with the one who actually did it and they pretended like they were going to set him up. The Jennifer Thompson case, we talked about Ronald Cotton, oh. the real the real perpetrator. He got him to take a picture saying, I want to set you up with my sister. Like, people are brilliant. Most That's right. Amazing. I feel good about that. Or wow. you, we've done so many cases by now that everything you say, like, brings up memories of a different case now. Yeah. And you got that exactly right. So well, it took it, me a few minutes, but I got no, it. No, it took you like 10 seconds. Oh, I was impressed. Okay. She hoped by becoming his pen pal, writing a letter, she could gather saliva DNA from, you know, any envelope he licked. But unfortunately, the letters went unreturned. But in an unbelievable stroke of luck, Earl had been transferred to the same prison where Clarence was being held, and even more unbelievable, the same cell block. I mean, it's not that unbelievable because it's Ohio. This, again, but reminds me of the Ronald Cotton case. It does. It's I like the stroke of luck that gets you, you know, get the truth to get the truth out. Honestly, it's, I don't know why I didn't think of that. But isn't it so similar? Yeah, now I'm thinking. Of and going, everyone like, said they looked alike and mistook them as everyone. Yeah. Whatever. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's hear it. I'm excited. Now it would be up to Clarence to get the DNA from Earl. But how would he get it? Well, that's easy. Oh. He can just wait for him to discard food or cigarette or... So smart, exactly. Earl was a smoker. Oh, so Clarence easy. and Melinda, in conjunction with Clarence's attorney, he has a couple attorneys mm -hmm. now, came up with a plan that Clarence would get a cigarette butt that Earl discarded and send it out of the prison for DNA testing. How can you send a cigarette butt out of the prison? That's probably... You know how you can't... They, like, check all the mail. Well, if it's, you know, in pages or paper wrapped, they yeah. don't check all the mail. They don't. Coming in more so than going out. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And they check... They do yeah. random checks yeah, on it, but true. you could definitely get a cigarette yeah. butt out, I think. Okay. But, I mean, this sounds like a movie, does it not? This is... I can't believe I haven't heard of this case. I can't believe that I, I didn't know it either. But I, even if you send the cigarette, out, the cigarette butt out, would, would it work? Would the DNA match? Would it be admissible? Would anyone even care? And Clarence, uh, he got the cigarette in an, from an ashtray and he put it in his Bible until he could send it out to his lawyer who sent it in for forensic testing. And when the lawyer had the DNA tested, it was a perfect match to <gasps> Earl Mann. Oh, my God. And is this unbelievable? It's unbelievable, but I'm dying to know if now they just assume that they were co-defendants. Because they did not have any luck in the courts, Mark Godseed sought help from the attorney general's office. You know, they're the top mm -hmm. legal counsel for the entire state. And they conducted an independent investigation concluding that Clarence was innocent. But even with the attorney general's support, the local prosecutors would not reopen the case against Clarence. It would take further DNA testing on a pubic hair found in Brooke's underwear <sighs> that matched Earl Mann before the prosecution would admit they indeed had the, the wrong man. 
But they did just that, just so you know. I think in part fearing the negative publicity storm that was about to come their way. And after over seven years in prison, Clarence was declared an innocent man and released just in time to celebrate Christmas with his family, which was what they were hoping for. So also, I mean, they had one, another point that, I, you know, I was going through this reading it. So they had DNA. They just didn't test the DNA, which is very frustrating. I know it was early on in DNA testing, but it was available. That's why we don't destroy evidence, so it can be retested. That's absolutely so. But people do destroy of evidence course. in I mean, cases. Yeah. Yeah. That's why we shouldn't destroy evidence. That's why we should not destroy. Yes. Okay. It sounds like, you know, a happy ending. You know, Clarence is exonerated. I mean, he still spent seven years in mm -hmm. prison, lost seven years of his life with his family, with his kids. But unfortunately, after his release, Melinda and Clarence soon divorced. There's some speculation about why and who, but the truth is it had been almost eight years and relationships change, life changes. I'm assuming they're still friends, though. I mean, she she did so much for him. I would imagine that's like a lifelong. Yeah. And they seem to when I when I saw like them speaking, uh, they seem to respect each other. They still speak very nicely about each other. And they both subsequently moved on to other relationships. Mm. So it wasn't, you know, total devastation. Yeah. Eventually, in 2008, Earl Mann finally pled guilty to the sexual assaults and murders and was, was sentenced to 55 years to life in prison. So why did he plead guilty? To avoid the death penalty. Oh, Ohio's a death penalty state. That makes sense. I was going to mm -hmm. say, what more, like at this point, that had to be, you know, some sweet deal. There had to be an incentive. But um, it was taking did you death. look at a picture? Did the two men look like Earl and I, Clarence? I saw the similarities. I mm -hmm. could see the resemblance. Especially if you were a six-year-old. In the middle of the night. Yeah. Right. I could I could understand. They also had like similar builds, you know what I mean? You know, we always yeah. encourage our listeners, you know, to do what Amy's doing right now and looking them up. But you know, you can make oh, your own. I've seen this. I've seen this gentleman before. Oh, so you do know who it is. By the way, it's yeah. Clarence Elkins. So um when they were married, it was Melinda Elkins, and I think she goes by Melinda Dawson now. Okay. I point that out for anyone who was wondering. So is she still working in the field? Here's what happened. There's more. Oh, okay. Clarence Elkins would eventually receive a settlement of $1 million with the state of Ohio, but he also later received a $5.25 million settlement with the city of Barberton, Ohio. So over $6 million. What's, do you know what the average compensation scheme is? Is there like an average? So the issue with compensation is that it varies state by state. Okay. But Besides the fact that it varies and some states, they'll cap it at a certain amount. Some states will do a certain amount per year, but a cap. Other states will actually look at what you're making prior and like prorate it. Right. There's all these different things. But the issue becomes a lot of states have restrictions. If you pled guilty, if you falsely confessed, if you did anything to contribute to your wrongful conviction, you are not eligible for compensation. I'm sorry. Yeah. So I, I knew that was... I knew some of those factors, but you even so you plead guilty and you're exonerated. You can't you're not going to receive in some any, states. Oh, I see. Right? It's not every state. I mean, every state has their own. The other interesting thing is some states have a restriction on if you had any priors, you are not eligible for compensation as if that has anything to do with your wrongful conviction. I, I'm sh I'm shocked. I did not know did that. Did you know I've published on this topic, Megan? You've published on uh, compensation. I didn't know compensation. I, I know that you'd published on um, exonerees, like life afterwards for them. No, from my uh, my dissertation data, I looked at compensation and how it's related to successful reentry. Oh. And not surprisingly, people who are compensated have a higher likelihood of staying out of prison. I mean, that and makes, having a successful reentry. That makes perfect sense. To but me. it's also once it's above a cap of five hundred thousand. Oh, so we did it like you know we looked okay. at like different levels of money, and yeah, you can't just like give someone fifty grand and be like, here, have fun. Like, no, of course not. Here, rebuild your whole life from scratch. And I, actually, sorry, I need to add one more thing yeah. to this. Compensation should not just be monetary. It needs to include job readiness. It needs to include um, therapy, mental health services. It needs to include, a, you know, tuition reimbursement. You know, it needs to be holistic. Right. And it needs to happen immediate. A lot of people have to wait years. Years for what? To get their compensation. Because you could, if, if you can get compensation through a state statute. Okay. You could get compensation through a civil lawsuit. Like he got it through both, right? Yeah. And then you could also get it through a private bill. But most people uh. get it through a state statute and or civil. It doesn't happen overnight. You know, it, like, and even going back into the court system after you've been wrongfully convicted, the last thing you want to do is go back into the court system right. and try to, you know, petition for money, you know? Right. You know, I, I 
didn't expect it to happen right away, but I hadn't thought about the fact that it could take a very long time. No, it could take years. That's, you know, travesty upon travesty. But some states now have more like gate money type of compensation. Oh, Immediate assistance for people when they leave prison. And that's how it should be. So how, how do we do in New Jersey in terms of compensating wrongfully convicted individuals? Not great because we are one of those states who as the person is not eligible for compensation if they pled guilty to the crime in which they were convicted. Yeah, that's disheartening for me. But if if you don't fall into that, then you can receive compensation. I believe it's like twice the amount of the income you're making in the year prior to your incarceration. And then four times all those years, right? Or 50000 per year, whichever is greater. So it's not, you know, it's not great. It doesn't sound great to me, but, but maybe it's not you know, the worst. It's better than uh, some yeah. states, you know, some states do not okay. give anything. So All right. So I can't say we're on the cutting edge, but we're not falling way behind either. After his compensation, Clarence was able to go on with his life, but he did share compensation with Melinda and obviously his sons. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, I think so. It's the honorable thing to do. But there's another interesting twist in Melinda's life. You see, about a year before her mother was murdered, Melinda and Judy had already received some publicity, appearing on The Maury Povich Show to discuss the Hicks baby scandal. The Have what? The Hicks baby scandal? No clue. I hadn't heard of this either, but I can't lie. I'm guilty of watching Maury Povich. I I, like sometimes watch like the reels when I need like to turn my brain off. Anyway, this scandal, the Hicks scandal, involved a number of babies who were illegally adopted out to parents who were not aware that they were actually adopting babies off the black market. How this happened, you ask, Amy? Well, what had happened was couples looking to adopt who didn't qualify with like mainstream agencies because of, I don't know, financial situations, age, Mm -hmm. health possibly relationship status. There was a clinic in Georgia, and I say clinic, like Mm -hmm. kind of quotes, that offered these couples alternative adoption options. So they were thrilled, right? The circumstances, though, might have given a clue that this was not exactly a legitimate enterprise because the couples were directed, this was what they were directed to do. Once they got the call that a baby was available, they had to get to the clinic within 12 hours, walk in the front door and sign the birth certificate, then take the baby out the back door and leave town. (laughs) What? I'm I'm not kidding. Like this was the, these were the instructions. That sounds shady. I have this in my notes. I know this sounds a little shady. That's what I wrote. But to desperate parents, this yeah. probably didn't face that much. Like, yeah. oh, okay, they want to keep it under wraps. They don't want everyone to know. They don't want any publicity. You yeah. know, there could be a million different reasons. And if you were one of those parents who, you know, Ugh. that's crazy. And it appeared that Dr. Hicks, the ringleader, was telling parents that their babies died during childbirth or shortly after, and then turning around and selling those babies to couples for adoption. Can you believe this? No. I can't believe I've never heard of that. Melinda Dawson was one of the Hicks babies. She was one of the babies? She was one of the babies who was sold to her parents, Judith and Homer, for $1,000 in 1963. What? Yes, I'm not kidding you. That's so random. And it wasn't until several years later that Judith, having divorced from Homer, remember I I said I thought they were divorced, told Melinda that she was adopted. But Melinda only really put it together that she was one of the Hicks babies in the 1990s. And that's when she and Judy, Judith, went on the Maury Povich show to tell their story and to try to find out what she really wanted to find out was who her biological siblings and parents were. Do you know if she ever found them? I sure do. She found out, sadly, she found out that her birth parents had died. But she did locate and meet with a biological brother a few years ago and both seemed very happy to have found each other through DNA. Melinda's... Wow, DNA helped her twice. Yes. Look at that. Yes. So Melinda is quite a role model and a reminder of what sheer will can do, I think. According to an article by news.com.au, Melinda is also a cancer survivor, a public speaker, and chair on the board of Ohioans to stop executions. And there's currently a movie in the works about her experiences and her work. Wow, pretty cool. I'm going to watch the movie. But now that we know uh, what happened to the family members, I'd like to discuss with you, Amy, why this happened. Um, And I obviously want to discuss, you know, you're an expert in wrongful convictions for sure. First, I think Clarence became the suspect, obviously, because his niece identified him rather quickly. So this makes sense. But should he be looked at within the proper context of eyewitness identifications, it seemed to me that the police didn't know anything about false eyewitness identifications. You probably know, but false identifications I know are the lead cause of wrong convictions. Yes, 70 to 75 percent of all wrongful convictions contained some sort of eyewitness error. That is a Isn't really that high, high I know. number. So, so, I mean, that's, I mean, that alone, just hearing those numbers should make us realize, okay, clearly eyewitnesses are not reliable. The biggest issue that it happened so early in the investigation is once Brooke said it was my Uncle Clarence, 
they honed in on him. Tunnel vision kicks in. Confirmation bias. They don't look elsewhere. So while they're focusing over here, over there, they have Earl, the actual perpetrator, hurting more people. Correct. So I think that's the the biggest issue. I know some of uh, the traditional issues with eyewitness identifications relate to lineup practices. I was going to ask you, they never even had her look at a lineup. They just took her word for it? Yeah. No, she didn't see a lineup. So it she was like, it was Clarence and it's like, okay, let's arrest Clarence. Yes. Usually it would be... It's Clarence. Okay, well, now we have to find evidence that corroborates that. At the very least, we have to conduct a lineup with people that look similar to Clarence to see if she still chooses Clarence. I'm shocked that they just took her word yeah. and didn't conduct a lineup. And I also wrote down on this topic, we know that there's also problems with traditional lineups, like the simultaneous versus the sequential yeah. lineup. Mm-hmm. Um, do you want to explain that or do you want me to? Yes. Just the difference? And Yeah, so what I find interesting is historically, well, the last couple of decades, it was sequential lineups are better. Sequential lineups are you see one picture at a time. Is this the person, yes or no, before moving on? Right. So you're you're matching each picture to your memory in your brain, whereas simultaneous lineups, you see all the pictures or all the people at once. Mm -hmm. You're using what's called relative judgment. Number two has his eyes, but number three has his ears. It looks a little like number four. You're kind of comparing each picture to each other, Mm -hmm. ignoring the picture in your brain. Again, for many decades, sequential was the best and a lot of jurisdictions around the country changed it to and you know there's other stuff there's you know it should be a double blind administration where the person conducting the lineup doesn't know who you know the suspect is there's you know making sure that all of the fillers look similar Mm -hmm. to the description given right so in other words you should ask brooke what did your attacker look like Mm -hmm. not Brooke says it's Clarence. Let's match everyone in the lineup to what Clarence looks like. That would be matched to suspect. Nope, you want to match to description. And it sounds like, obviously, they never even got that far. No. But if they conducted a lineup correctly, they would have said, Brooke, what does he look like? And then they would have put Clarence in a lineup with people that fit the description of what Brooke said. Clearly, they didn't do that. No, they didn't. You know, when you have the double blind, it also eliminates, you know, feedback, whether it's conscious or unconscious feedback. The problem with that, it inflates confidence. So then an eyewitness goes to trial. Maybe they weren't that confident. I think it's guy number three. But then the detective's like, good job, you got him. Yep. <laughs> or even if it's, a, you know, a nonverbal, you know, like, <clears throat> okay, today's done, you know. And then you get to trial and all of a sudden you're out of 10. I'm so confident. I know who it was. No, nope. um, you've definitely covered a lot here. Um, one of the, the one, another suggestion is like uh, the statement that the suspect may be in the oh, lineup. So that would be cautionary instructions. So why is that important? If you tell someone, pick out the person from the lineup, you think that means the person's in there. Yeah. If they say the person may or may not be in there. I do this with my students. So I show them a video. Yes. And then I show them a lineup and I... Without cautionary instructions, I'll say, you know, pick which one is the guy. And everyone picks someone. And I'm like, you all just wrongfully convicted someone. <laughs> but if you That's say good... but if you say the perpetrator may or may not be in the lineup, mm-hmm. that number goes so far down because people now know, oh, oh, they're not definitely in there. I have the option. I think that's such an important point, Amy. They also talked about confidence or I read about confidence statements, which you kind of said. So but... the reason why the statements are important is because I think it's number three. How confident are you? Um I'm 50-50. Right. Oh, good job. And then a year till trial. And in that year, everyone's like telling you how good you are or you in your head now when you replay what happened to you, it's that person's face. Right. So now you get on the stand. Oh, how confident are you? 100% confident. Oh, really? Because on cross, now you could say that's, you know, here on this date, when you identified this person, you were only 50% confident. What changed? Eyewitness is one of those areas that the reforms are really, really important. And they're tangible. They um, are. Now, a lot of these issues aren't relevant for Brooke's case because no. she didn't see a lineup, which you think they should Which should've. I can't even believe that. But there are also issues with child as eyewitnesses anyway. Um, do you know what some of those issues are? Or do you want me to, I'll just tell you. We're getting well, late. Well, yeah. So. I mean, they're, I, I know that they're more, um, the suggestibility is much higher yes. with children. Yes. And, you know, trauma affects children different. No, it's, yeah. it's suggestibility yeah. definitely by uh-huh. adults. And so, you know, the influence of basically adults. So if Brooke had identified Clarence early on, but possibly changed her identification, you know, with the interference and prompting of the district attorney and other adults, she might have felt a lot more pressure Mm -hmm. to recall, you know, the identification incorrectly. And in fact, later when she wasn't subject to adult interference, she Mm -hmm. remembered the attack differently. And when she wasn't in a traumatic state, 
Yeah. There's a number of studies, Amy, that have concluded that children, in fact, are more susceptible to leading questions and may be misled in this regard. Yeah. So I think there's a well-established literature. I think there's also a bit of criminological theory here, too, Amy, um, in terms of labeling theory. Uh, so, you know, once Clarence was labeled the murderer, his relationship with his mother-in-law, it seemed to take a more tumultuous tone. Mm -hmm. Like, I think it went from maybe they weren't best friends. To, no, no, they didn't get along. They had fights. You know, and Melinda had said that wasn't even true. People said that Melinda and Clarence had separated twice. Mm -hmm. And when they did, Melinda stayed with her mother and that Clarence called and threatened Judy. Melinda said on the stand that absolutely never happened. Can you just clarify, because my students have issues with this, and I have to admit I do too, because mm -hmm. when I think about labeling theory, to me, it explains why someone becomes an offender. They become an offender because society pretty much tells them, like, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. Society says, like, you're no good. You commit. So, for example, a juvenile does something. Now they're labeled mm -hmm. as a bad kid. They get Correct. older. They commit crime. Correct. I don't use labeling theory in my classes to explain situations like you just explained. Yeah, I usually explain labeling in the way that you did, but okay. I also can explain that once a label's been applied, all the interactions or everything a person does is interpreted um, in a different light. Gotcha. So, so okay. once you become the bad kid, mm -hmm. you know, once that label's applied to you, then it's not, oh, I remember they actually, you know, were the, the kid, I think he vandalized something yeah. or I think he, you know, is a liar. Yeah. So they're interpreting, I think, Clarence's actions now through all a different of his lens. interactions. So I think once he was labeled, you know, yep. the guy who did it. Now, yeah. if Clarence were to go on and commit a crime now, to me, that's pure labeling right there. That would there. be pure labeling theory. Because Absolutely. then you're looking at, and, you know, my research with exonerees, I looked at post exoneration offending. And right. That's how I explained some people who ended up offending after exoneration. It's because, yeah, because for this many years, you treated them like a criminal. Absolutely. And now what do you expect? No, absolutely. I mean, either way, I think the jury interpreted his actions in terms of that label, like yeah. the harassing son-in-law, yeah. yep. you know, mm -hmm. which might help explain the attack against Judith, but it doesn't explain the sexual assault on her or Brooke. No. Okay. So. Um, do we want to talk about theories of why Earl did it, or we don't know enough about Earl, probably? He, Earl was a... Just a predator. A, a yeah. career, I mean, he's a career sexual offender. Mm -hmm. um, and I, th I think that... It might have been a crime of opportunity. He lived next door. Maybe he noticed an open window. Oh, certainly. I'm sure it was opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and he was had a very specific type. He targeted children. Mm -hmm. So a serial predator. He could predator. have been like... Yeah, he could have been watching them. And Oh, for sure. And I think if not, in if not for being in prison, he would continue to be a predator, mm -hmm. absolutely, to society and always a danger. So uh, did the justice system get it right? Eventually. But not from the beginning to end. No, no, no. They honed in on Clarence due to the victim's account, which is fine to start with, but it's not okay to end with. Nope. They discounted Melinda's alibi completely and the alibi from his friends establishing that he got home around, it was a little bit later too, it wasn't 2.30 a.m., 2.40. They tried Clarence with almost no evidence. I think the biggest issue, you know, I understand why they weren't taking his wife and friend's alibi, mm -hmm. like, and you know, really holding much weight to it. Mm -hmm. But the fact that they had tunnel vision and only looked at Clarence and didn't even bother investigating. Yes. That is the issue. You know, everything, you, almost everything <laughs> you've said has been like my next line. I'm not even kidding. Aww. I think that there was just clear tunnel vision here. They, you know, like if Melinda didn't have that tenacity, if they didn't work so hard to pre like present irrefutable evidence of Earl Mann's guilt, I don't think Clarence Elkins ever would have been freed. No, not at all. He's very lucky. Yeah, I mean, I, I would like to end that. On a positive note, he was able to go on with his life. He was compensated. And like I said, he shared that compensation with his family. And he and Melinda are able to go on and share their stories and help other families. So I think that's the positive takeaway here. Yeah. No, I really appreciate you bringing this type of case because usually I will ch I would choose a wrongful conviction case. Right? But it's nice to be hearing a case about it. And, and do, one would, I didn't know. Would you agree that she's a trailblazer? Yeah, that's why I think it's a cool case because it's like a little different. All right. Well, I'm glad I was Thank able you. to share it with you. I know it was an exciting. And thanks for sharing all your expertise on this episode. Oh, but Megan, before we go, do we have any questions today? We do. We have a couple of questions from our supporters. I will start by reading one. What career do you suggest that I pursue that can incorporate addiction, sex work, advocacy of those affected by the two and breaking the stigma while also being sure they get the justice they deserve as victims? And how would you suggest one with a criminal past from over 12 years ago go about this? Okay, well, first off, I think we've come a long way. People who have criminal histories are actually welcomed in fields that work with victims because they have a unique perspective. 
Yes. You know, a lot of my students that I work with when they get out, I, you know, when I teach in prison, mm -hmm. a lot of my students get out with very lengthy criminal histories and mm -hmm. they are very much welcomed in careers that help individuals affected by the very systems that they were affected by. I agree. I've seen a lot of this. I think that some of the ways that people are, are working in these fields are with re-entry organizations in particular, because there's so many of them. Also with uh, substance abuse, counseling, and casework, and social work. Mm -hmm. so I think those are some of the you know positions that are really, really um, well, that would fit very well with um, these kinds of interests. Also working in victim advocacy, Absolutely. working either for the courts or for a nonprofit organization that works directly with victims and families. Yes, I agree. So and, and I agree with you also, the criminal history stigma is re we're really marching away from that. So you will be able to find job opportunities in the fields we just discussed. Mm -hmm. We have one other question, Amy, you want to read it? Sure. Thinking about international crime, do you see any differences in the motives to commit crime? Are there cultural nuances that perhaps we don't see here in the States or Canada? Oh, yeah. I love this question. Right. Um, so I haven't done any research on it, so I'm just going to kind of go off the cuff on this one. Okay. I think what comes to mind is our focus on materialism mm -hmm. and our class structure Correct. in our society. I think that fuels a lot. I mean, you see that when we talk about the theories like institutional enemy theory mm -hmm or even strain theory, a lot of um, conflict theory. Absolutely. Right? The fact that our system, the fact that we are so stratified in so our- stratified, like, highly capitalistic. Yes, exactly. So I think that thirst for always wanting more. Plays a role in the types of co crimes too that we see committed here. You know, unfortunately, when we talk about that class system, it means a lot of blocked opportunities, which is why we see a lot of, you know, crime that is attributed to people who don't have the means. Yeah, because unfortunately, our society does not, help people climb that social ladder. No, I also think culturally, we also have firearms is a big part of our culture. And so I think that plays a very large role in why our violent crime rate is so much higher than other similarly situated countries. Also, I'd like to point out, in um, this is very nuanced, but in serial offending, it's very different from culture to culture, the motives. Um, so, you know, our serial killers tend to kill for sexual motives and pleasure, whereas that is very different with other cultures who might kill for more utilitarian purposes. So I think offending is very different, you know, it, it, whether it's as specific as serial murder or as general as generalized crimes are. And also we can't ignore how different criminal justice systems are Absolutely. and how we over-criminalize, uh, particularly people of social races and classes. Yeah, I would say that, that that certainly plays a role too. Great question. We could have actually, we could yeah, probably- Yeah, I was gonna say, I could probably go on for a whole, a whole episode here on that question. Well, we do a comparative criminal justice course, so we actually can teach a course in that as well. Yeah, so come to our class. Yeah, yeah. come to one of our classes. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone, for sharing in this female trailblazer episode. Hope you enjoyed it. And we'll see you next time on Women in Crime. Women in Crime is written and hosted by Megan Sachs and Amy Schlossberg. Our producer is James Varga, edited by Jose Alfonso. Music composition is by Dessert Media. If you enjoy the show, please remember to subscribe and leave a review. You can also support the show through Patreon, where you can get access to additional ad-free content such as virtual happy hours and an extra full-length episode each month. For more information, visit patreon.com slash women in crime. Sources for today's episode include the Dayton Daily News, NBC News, Dateline Interview, Cleveland.com, News.com.au, www.wykc.com, and The Claims Journal.